multivariate data? We might have four purposes. One is to control for things. Two is to detect interactions. Three is to make predictions. And four is to develop hypotheses. If we're doing the latter two, making predictions or developing hypotheses, we're probably in data mining territory, which again means that we are trying to find patterns amidst a large data set. So first, let's talk about how we got here. Remember, we can use GLMs to evaluate hypotheses, like a conditional hypothesis or an interaction sort of hypothesis. And having very specific hypotheses protects us from capitalizing on chance or it protects us from overfitting. And when we are evaluating a hypothesis, we generally only care about one parameter in our statistical model. But sometimes we have so many variables in our model, we can't even begin to think of how to formulate a specific hypothesis. We may not yet care about the theoretical rationale for why these variables relate to this outcome. We just wanna know which variables are best to predict the outcome. And if we're in that situation, then we use data mining, but now we have to worry about overfitting. What we can do to address this is use general linear models and make sure we're cross-validating, but it wasn't really designed to do that sort of a thing. Instead, we can use something like random forest or another machine learning algorithm. And these algorithms were designed for data mining. Well, data mining can be used to generate hypotheses or it can be used to make predictions. And today we're talking about one machine learning or data mining algorithm, which is called random forest. Never mind. What? Last time you yelled at me for asking a question. I'm sorry. That's okay, I guess. So? What is random forests? Thank you. Random forests are based on decision trees. So let's look at a graphic. Let's say you're trying to predict whether an individual has a girlfriend. And to predict, you're going to use two variables. One is how many Comic Con conventions they have attended. And two is their age. So this decision tree tells us a model we can use to fit our data. Well, the first branching point in the decision tree is whether you have attended three or more Comic Con conventions. If you have, then the model predicts that you have no girlfriend. And that 18 out of 20 means that there were 20 people who attended three or more conventions. And out of those 20, 18 of them were correctly classified as having no girlfriend. On the other hand, 35 people attended less than three. Out of those, 23 had a girlfriend. And now we add our additional variable, age greater than or equal to 26. Are you older than 26? If yes, we're gonna go to the left. And that tells us that 10 of those people out of the 35 were older than 26. And we classify them as having no girlfriend. And we are correct 60% of the time or six out of 10 times. And for those who, people who are younger than 26 on the right, we classify that you do have a girlfriend and we are correct 19 out of 25 times. So that's the decision tree and there are lots of algorithms out there to fit decision trees to data. And for this example, we had a binary outcome. Do you have a girlfriend or not? But you could also use decision trees for numeric variables. Here's an example of that. And here we're trying to predict the number of conventions you went to. And this time we're using three variables, whether you had a girlfriend, whether you are a vendor and your nerd score. And so I'm not gonna go through the whole decision tree, but let's just go down one branch. Let's say you do have a girlfriend and you are a vendor. It estimates that you have attended 0.65 conventions on average. On the other hand, if you have no girlfriend and your nerd score is greater than seven, we predict that you will have attended almost five conventions in your life. So that's the basic idea behind the decision tree. So random forests are a collection of hundreds or thousands of decision trees. Catch the clever name of that algorithm? So what random forest will do when it constructs a single decision tree, instead of selecting all the variables in the model, it will only select a subset of those variables. So maybe you have 30 variables, but it might only select five of those variables. And then with those five variables, it's gonna construct a decision tree. And it's going to use not your entire data set to construct that decision tree, but instead it's only gonna use 66% of your sample. Using that 66% of the sample, it's going to generate its own decision tree. And it's going to build that decision tree using statistical algorithms that you don't need to know about. Just know that it's constructing a decision tree. And so again, it has selected a subset of the variables and it has selected a subset of your sample. And now what it's going to do is the 34% of your data that wasn't selected, it calls that the out of bag sample. So the idea is that you've got like a bag of marbles or something, and then you pull out 34% of those variables to use later and you use the 66% of the variables to actually build your model. 
Once it uses 66% of your data to build the model, it will then take your 34% and pass those variables through the model. And then once it passes those variables through the model, it's going to estimate the accuracy, which we call the out of bag accuracy or the out of bag error. And your out of bag error is your cross validation set. So notice how Random Forest is natively building in this cross validation component, which is awesome. And so after it builds one decision tree, then it'll build another decision tree using the same approach and then another decision tree. And every single decision tree is gonna have probably a different combination of variables. And then at the end of the day, you have 500, 1,000, 2,000 different decision trees. And then what it does is it takes your entire data set, runs them through all those decision trees, and then computes the average estimate if you're using a numeric variable. If you're trying to classify things, it figures out the mode prediction. I just wanna say, that I don't get it. I'm more lost and confused than a fly in a car banging around and smacking windows and stuff. Still not getting it? I got your back. Let's go ahead and look at a real example with data. Meet Joe. Hi guys. Joe has no girlfriend and he has a nerd score of 2.5. Let's use this decision tree to predict how many conventions Joe has been to. Because he has no girlfriend, he's gonna go on the right side of the decision tree. And because his nerd score is 2.5, which is less than seven, we're going to predict that he has attended 3.4 conventions. What do you have to say about that, Joe? Hooray, that's pretty good. Boy, that was pretty clear, I think. So that's the basics of random forests. Now, how do you interpret random forests? We will get into that a little more in our next video where we're gonna talk about our code for random forests. But I will say this, you can always visualize random forest models with Flexplot which makes it super easy and super intuitive to look at random forest models. But there's also two other metrics of interest. One is the out of bag error. The out of bag error is gonna tell you how accurate you were in estimating those observations that were out of bag or that were not used to fit the model. So we could easily look at the output of a random forest and look at the out of bag error and figure out what proportion of the time we were wrong, at least if we were looking at binary outcomes. And so you would interpret it like percent incorrect. So very intuitive. On the other hand, if you're using numeric variables, it's a little more tricky because the out of bag error is actually expressed as sum of squared errors. And they're not as intuitive to interpret, but that's okay because we have another metric that we can use to interpret things and that is variable importance. And like the name suggests, it tells you how important a variable was in estimating the random forest model. And there's lots of different metrics out there that exist to measure variable importance, but my favorite is called permutation variable importance. So the basic idea behind permutation is it goes back over the hundreds or thousands of trees that you've created and at every node of that tree, it takes the variable that splits that node. In this example, that would be conventions attended. And what it does is it shuffles everyone's convention score. So if Joe loved Comic-Con conventions and he had a score of seven, it's gonna shuffle his score with everybody else. So he might get Tom's score, who's never been to a convention. And so by shuffling the scores, it breaks any association that variable had with the outcome. Basically what you're doing is you're making it random. The idea is you can look at the predictions under the existing data set with a shuffled data set, and if they are vastly different, that tells you that that variable was super important in predicting somebody's score. And so the permutation variable importance measure, it tells you the difference in prediction accuracy before versus after shuffling the scores. So there are several key advantages to random forest. One, it has cross validation already built into the algorithm. That's probably the biggest and the best advantage. But there are also two additional advantages. One, it can natively detect interaction effects. So you remember how with a GLM you have to explicitly model an interaction? But with random forest you don't. It natively detects interactions. And how does it do that, you ask? I'm not gonna go big into the details, but if you think about it, it'll make sense. Now remember, with a general linear model, it's trying to fit a straight line. So to fit an interaction, you have to explicitly tell it there are two different lines. But with random forest, it's not trying to fit a straight line. Essentially what it does is it takes little pockets or subsets of the data. So it might find people who are super high on the nerdiness scale, and they've attended a lot of conventions, and they are not a vendor. And then for each of those pockets, it's gonna generate unique predictions. And there's no guarantee that when you plot conventions on the x-axis, that those different predictions are gonna form a straight line. They might be all over the place. In fact, look at this. They indeed are all over the place. Again, this shows that the random forest model is looking at different pockets at different subsections of the data and generating unique predictions. And so here we have an example where the predicted number of conventions attended goes up for your nerd score if you have no girlfriend, whereas it goes down if you do have a girlfriend. Makes sense, so it natively detects interactions. But also look at this plot again. That is not a linear fit. 
And that's another advantage of random forests, is there is no restriction that the line has to be straight. So you can fit nonlinear terms. So again, it natively detects interactions, it natively detects nonlinear terms, and it cross validates. Win, win, win. But of course, there's always gonna be some disadvantages. The biggest disadvantage of random forests is it's what we call a black box algorithm. So in general linear models, you have a model that you can then use to fit another data set. And you can share that fit with somebody else. You can give them the equation, the slopes and the intercept. In random forest, you don't have an equation. Instead, you have thousands of decision trees. In other words, it's not transportable. To generate new predictions, you have to run computer code. So random forest is not good for building a model that you want to transport to other situations. And once again, it is aimed for hypothesis generation, not hypothesis testing. So I tend to use a strategy that I'll talk about more in the next video, where I leverage the strengths of random forest and the strengths of GLMs. So I use random forest to find the variables that are interesting, as well as a guide to figure out what kind of interactions I need to input in my model, and also the functional form. If it's curved, I might do a polynomial. And so it gives me a lot of information that I can then build a statistical model with general linear models. Another disadvantage is it's not well understood. A lot of people have misconceptions about these. A couple years back, I was hired as a consultant to read a paper and give my feedback on the statistical methods, which was great. And so what this author had done is he had like 15 different variables and he ran a massive GLM or a massive multiple regression model. And then at the end of this paper, he said, hey, this one was statistically significant and this one was statistically significant and this one. And so what I said to the person who hired me is I said, it sounds like you're not really doing hypothesis testing. Instead, you're doing hypothesis generation. I would recommend a random forest. Little did I know that the person who hired me actually hired two statisticians. And I used the term statistician loosely because this guy didn't know what he was talking about. And so what he ended up doing was he shared my feedback to the other statistician and the other statistician's feedback to me. You want to know what the other statistician said? Clearly this man has no idea what he's talking about for he used a random forest in a situation for which random forest should not be used. Really? And he basically said, no, you only use random forest when you have thousands of variables, not 15. Ugh. No, 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 no. Random Forest is there for data mining. This was a data mining question. Random Forest was perfect. And the, the honest truth is, at least in psychology, they're not very well used. So some people have some misconceptions about Random Forest. And in the description, when this paper is finished, I have a link about Random Forest models in psychology. For those of you who are watching this video as it's produced, probably not there yet, but when I get around, I will post it there. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, how decision trees predict scores. Number two, how the random forest algorithm works. Again, it's going to generate hundreds or thousands of decision trees. And for each tree, it's going to randomly select a subset of variables. And it's also going to randomly select two thirds of the data and then leave the remaining one third out for cross validation. I didn't mention this earlier, but technical side note, it actually bootstraps that two thirds of your data. So it's not technically selecting it, but that's not part of the learning objective because that's a technical nuance thing that you don't need to worry about. Number three, interpreting random forests. Again, this objective is gonna be more important in the next video, but for now, remember you can always visualize them with Flexplot. You can calculate out of bag error and you can calculate variable importance. Number four, the advantages of random forest models. They have a built-in cross-validation component, they natively detect interactions, and they natively detect nonlinear effects. Disadvantages of random forests, they are a black box algorithm, which means they are not really transportable. And another disadvantage is that they're not very well understood. And uppity academics have misunderstandings about them. Lame. And your last learning objective is how to combine general linear models with random forest models. And again, we use random forest models to select the variables and to give us some ideas on which interactions and non-linear relationships we got to model. And then we use the GLM to actually fit that sort of a model and then it can be transported. And with that, peace out.